Welcome back, everyone. Today we're talking Star Trek Picard's Season 2, Episode 8, entitled Mercy. And if you're thinking, well, we're getting pretty close to the end of the season, we're probably getting answers, you'd kind of be mistaken. There are a couple things revealed in this episode, but it seems like they're going to drag it all the way out to the end of Season 2 before we get any of the answers we're looking for, if not even passed into Season 3. Without further ado, though... This episode kicks off with that uh, flashback scene that we were, you know, treated to in the preseason trailers of what appeared to be Vulcans and or Romulans in a forest, uh, not really attacking, but uh, approaching a young boy. Well, it turns out in this episode they are Vulcans, and this is a flashback scene to a character we have in the series, but they don't reveal that right as of yet. They cut immediately back to Picard and Guinan under arrest, or at least incarcerated in some sort of interrogation room, with Agent Wells, who was, if you can recall, the man who walked into Guinan's bar at the end of the last episode, and showed them the footage of Picard transporting into the alleyway between Ten Ford earlier in the season, and he believes that these two are aliens, probably here to do something with the Europa mission, to stop it, to infiltrate Earth, to, to do something. So he's obviously on the side of the law here, or at least he claims he is, trying to figure out what they're attempting to do to Earth and if he can stop them from doing it. Um, has a nice little conversation with them where obviously Picard and Guinan are, oh, we're not aliens, and Guinan laughs at the thought that he thinks they're aliens, and then he starts writing in his little notepad, and she's like, you know, what are, what are you doing? Oh, you know, I'm just making note of the fact that aliens also have humor. And then he goes into a little spiel about how nobody knows you're here, you're, you know, you're just a number in a file, nobody's ever going to come for you, I'm the only one who knows you're here, you're just going to be lost in bureaucracy and you've got no hope. You know, blah, 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 the normal type of stuff you hear in, in situations, you know, with a bad government sort of guy trying to intimidate. And then Picard kind of, like, seems taken aback, like, oh my god, this is, this is serious, I'm in danger, like, Hasn't Picard dealt with situations like this before? I mean, he's been beaten, interrogated by several people, especially that two-part, uh, I think, with Chain of Command episode where he was captured by the Cardassians and pretty much told the same thing. Like, his life is gone. He can either be a pet or uh, live a life of torture and servitude. I mean, he's dealt with stuff like this before. He should kind of know what's going on here. Maybe he's taken aback because he didn't think humans were capable of this. I don't know, but there's no actual physical damage done. It is what it is. He's, it's just threats at this point. Just threats from Agent Wells. Then we cut to Rafi and Annika Hansen. They're still at the scene of the crime where uh, Gerardi broke that window to get her endorphins going. She's not there, obviously. They, um, they notice that there's a guy cleaning up the mess now, and they go to ask him, basically, you know, what, what's going on? Where did this woman go? He's like, well, I don't help cops, so... Seven goes into some little act about, well, actually, I'm I'm not a cop. I'm, I'm her sister. She's got mental health issues, and we need to track her down before the cops find her. He's like, oh, that's cool then. Uh, she went that way with some guy with a red beard. They figure that out. Uh, Gerardi, or uh, uh, Rafi, rather, and Annika Hansen had this little conversation about, you know, Seven not being a Borg anymore and, and how she knows. She still has her Borg memories, obviously, but she doesn't have the implants, so she can't do a Borg tracky thing to find the queen. And uh, they get in this little heated argument, which will continue later in the episode. Basically, they're uh, now dealing a little bit with why things didn't work out between Rafi and Seven, at least the first time. Whether or not they're getting back into a, a relationship. I don't know. Then we cut back to Agent Wells, who is now showing Picard and Guinan that he's got security footage of all of them broken into the Europa, uh, not press event, the, the gala, the gala, however you say that word, a couple nights ago, however long ago that was. He's like, hmm, why would aliens want to break into a space flight mission? I don't know. I, I feel like that might be one of the main things aliens would want to do if, if they're actually going to come here. But, you know, far be it for me to make that claim because I don't want anyone claiming I'm an alien. So then we cut over to Kore Soong, who we didn't see last episode. We really haven't seen much of this season. And as you may or may not recall, uh... She found out that she's basically just a hunk of genetic goo that was grown into a real girl by her not-father, Dr. Adam Soong. And she's still kind of dealing with that situation, kind of going through the 
information she could find on the laptop to try and figure out more about what the hell's actually going on with her life. And then she puts on these uh, these little three not three D virtual reality reality goggles that she calls expectus. Um, I don't think they're real. The word means like to look or to see something along those lines in Latin. Probably something that Adam Soong invented. So as she puts on those goggles, who should appear? Q, but not Q. This is some sort of, uh, I don't know, sentient AI that Q programmed into the virtual rea reality goggles back when he hacked into Soong's lab earlier in the season, just for this moment so that he could talk to Kore Soong. I don't know, it, se it seems a little convoluted, but I guess it works. It was, it was a fun scene. It's always great seeing John Delancey interact because he's still kind of got that gravitas that unfortunately Patrick Stewart has kind of lost with his with his voice this past couple of years. So he's great talking to her, you know, and, and not really riddles, but kind of his normal, you know, his normal manner where he's verbose and kind of over explaining things in flowery language and basically says, well, I, I can cure you. I can give you freedom from your father. I can give you the key. And it uh, turns out that he does have a key for her that he delivers to her in a box from the previews we saw her receiving a little gift wrap box. That was from Q. That was this little vial of the blue goo that we do recall earlier in the season. She took her Adam received from Q, gave it to her. She was able to go outside briefly for you know a little bit before she reverted to her dying form. Apparently this is supposed to be a permanent version of that, or at least we're led to believe that, so now she has the key to her own freedom from Jean Delancey version of Q. I'm going to try to say that because there are more Q, even though we have not yet seen them in this season, at least as far as we know. Then they cut back to Rafi and Seven finding the body of the red-headed beard guy that was talked about earlier that Gerardi followed out of the bar, and he is dead. And now we go into the backstory about Seven and Rafi and their relationship, and here we find out that the Borg Queen in Gerardi's body is trying to recreate that connection she felt in the collective one-on-one -on -one with this individual, but it didn't really cut it. It's, it's not like it was in the collective, so she killed him, and Seven kind of breaks down a little bit saying, that's, that's pretty much apt. That's how she felt. You know, she, she's broken inside. She can't uh, have one-on-one -on -one relationships because they pale in comparison to what she felt in the collective with, you know, all of those minds and thoughts and, you know, collective consciousness, whatever you want to call it. So that, that's kind of why it didn't work out with the Rafi. Also, we find out it didn't work out with Rafi because, and this was great, Seven calls Rafi on her BS, basically like, you know, you are a master manipulator. All you do is manipulate people. You think you're hiding it. Every person can see it. You're really bad at this. You know, stop manipulating people. That's also a bad, bad character trait. Thank you. Thank you for calling her out on that, Annika. She needed to hear that. Although later in the episode, she basically doesn't, you know, she, she goes back to being a jerk. But it is what it is. So then they find out that, oh, this guy dropped a cell phone. Um, what's going on with Jurati? Oh, she's trying to use modern technology to up her nanoprobe production. But she can't do it in a great way because obviously the technology is outdated. So she's using batteries, like phone batteries, car batteries, things of that nature. Um, they find her stealing the energy from car batteries. She beats the crap out of them. She's about to kill Rafi, and then she just, you know, she was choking her, and then, boom, just drops her to the ground and walks away in this, you know, really uh, uh, cool shot, I guess, of, you know, establishing, not really an establishing shot. She walks away, and they're basically, well, that's weird. Borg don't ever have any sort of mercy. Well, Gerardi does. She must still be inside there kind of controlling things. That's how we leave that for now. Then, finally... Thank God they addressed this. For all I know, it was a reshoot because everyone was so PO'd at um, them not addressing it. But finally, we find out what happens to Rios' comm badge. So while he was interrogating Picard, he found out, this is Agent Wells, he found out that Picard had a big bruise on his hand. Picard's like, oh, I was at a clinic getting an IV. I am only human after all. So he looks up in the area, boop doop doo Oh, found out Teresa's clinic, um, went to investigate it, and voila found Rios's communicator that he left there way back in whatever episode that was, two or three. We've been wondering why this has not been brought up. They addressed it. Thank you. Thank you for addressing it, because if it was left out there as a plot hole, a lot of us would not have been able to sleep. <laughs> then, 
we go to the nice Rios, Teresa, um, Ricardo, whatever her kid's name is. They're on the La Serena, and they're just playing around. Um, he's doing little shenanigans on the computer to try and find out if there's more Borg tech. And then he tells them, oh, you know, get whatever the hell you want from the replicator. And the child, Ricardo, Roberto, whatever his name is, he orders four cakes, please. And the computer's just like, okay, cool. Here's just four slices of cake. Four slices of cake. And uh, I guess that's that's cool. It's something a kid would do, but I don't know. I, I feel like in the past, the, the replicator's always been annoying. Like, oh, it's, please specify temperature of cake. Please specify type of cake, blah, blah, blah. Maybe because this is Confederation technology, they don't do that. But anyways, it was a fun scene. <laughs> um, then we get into this really, really, I, I found it annoying story. Even though Rios and Teresa are a great couple, I like them. Their chemistry on the show is amazing. She goes into this whole speech about, you know, um, let's pretend that um, we're in a 10-year relationship. Tell me something very personal and secret about yourself. It was just very, like, odd. I get what they're going for, but it was just like, okay. This, this this coming out of nowhere in a little, you know, 5,000 miles per hour too fast. So they have this little speech, and Rios is about to tell her how he feels. Then her kid bursts in and says, I have a tummy ache from theoretically eating all the cake, even though we see in the shot that most of the cake is still there. I don't know if this was just supposed to be played for laughs or if there's something else going on. We know the ship has some board tech in it. Did he just eat some nanoprobes in the, that cake? Was there a trap in there? Is that going to be part of the story? I don't know. I'm probably overanalyzing things. It's probably not going to happen, but I feel like this whole situation taking place on a Borg-infected ship is going to come into play somehow, and what better way for that to come into play to move their story forward than to have him need to save her family because of something. Otherwise, they're just hanging out on the ship and having a fun time. Then she turns around, gives him a kiss, so finally they're admitting their feelings to each other. Even though we, they, in the grand scheme of things, haven't spent that much time together. Then we cut over to Q finally responding to Guinan's summons. He's wearing the FBU uniform. Um, she had been taken out of the room to be interrogated separately from Jean-Luc. And uh, kind of reminiscent to Q in what he, he was in Stargate. He was a kind of shady, undercover government agent there. I don't think he was the FBI. I think he was in the NID over there. Um... I don't know, probably wasn't supposed to be a reference to that, but I just found it interesting to see him in this kind of FBI uniform again. I think he wore a suit in Stargate, but it was cool. I, I like seeing him in that kind of shadowy thing, but he's being cute. He talked to Guy and tells him, tells her that uh, the summoning didn't work. She, you know, she's using it as a cheap parlor trick. It's supposed to be so much grander than that. And then Guy discovers that the fear and uncertainty she felt was actually from Q, not from herself. And that Q is dying. And um, at least that was the way she put it. Q said that he actually prefers to think of it as something else. The next great adventure, the unknown, things of that nature. But, you know, it's the first time he in his existence that he has ever viewed himself as anything other than immortal. So it was breaking the monotony and like, ah, oh, finally, I've got something to figure out. As his powers dwindle... Um, He's fearing death because it's not turning out the way he wanted it to. He feels like he's just fading away into nothingness and on the threshold of the unknowable. And instead of burning out like a star, he's just fading away, disappearing into nothing. So that's what's going on with Q. He's dealing with that. Um, Guinan seems to have some powers we didn't know before, but we'll get back to that in a minute because now we have to cut back to Corey Soong and Adam Soong finally having a conversation. He decides to finally reveal that she's just a test tube baby. Um, he tries to manipulate her a little bit. He's, he goes from like full on insane scientist back to, all right, I understand I made a problem, but I, I do love you. She's like, all right, I've had enough of your bullshit. I'm going to get the hell out of here. And, um, uh, there's not really much you could do to stop me because I now have this magic cure that the uh, hologram version of Q gave me. So I'm just going to walk outside and there's not much you can do about that. Right, Pops? So she walks outside. He's like, wait, what? How can you do this? And she's basically like, peace out. I'll see you later. And then that's that. Cut back to this uh, randomly horrific backstory of Elnor and Rafi, which basically is here to show us how Rafi can manipulate, as we mentioned earlier, 
to throw Elnor in here because he's technically part of the main cast, even though he's barely been in either season. And this shows that Rafi was trying to talk him out of what he wanted to do to stay in Starfleet and follow in her footsteps. He didn't want to. He wanted to go back to the Quat Malat, however you say that, to do some more honorable stuff for the planet Vashti. She's like, well, you know, do whatever you want. Um, I'm not here to run your life, but I, I pretty much thought you wanted to be like me and join Starfleet. So, you know, whatever, let me down. And she talked him into staying. She thinks that's the reason um, she's responsible for his death. So it is good to see that she does have sort of a reason for feeling so awful when he died because we had not seen that. We had not seen that relationship. But it's a little late now. I mean, it, it, that's not something that was established. It's kind of like, oh, well, we'll show you after the fact. It, does, it doesn't hit emotionally when they do that. So that was just a flashback scene of them on the La Serena. At La Serena between season one and two, I, I would assume. I mean, they didn't state when this is set, but I would only assume it happened between seasons. Then, Borg Gerardi breaks into Adam Soong's house and basically tells him that, uh, you've got what I need. I can help you. You can help me. Let me use all your resources to become the big Borg queen and I'll help you achieve what I saw happened in that alternate future where you're basically the savior of humanity, this great deity. The only thing you need to trade for that is, you know, that, that daughter that you don't really care about that just walked out the door. You know, you can have everything you want if you help me, or you could die a drunk vomiting on the floor and nobody cares about you. We know that might not necessarily be true because obviously he's a, a an ancestor of the Sooms we come to know, so there definitely does appear to be a lineage either way, but that is what it is. Now we see Guy and Sweet awesome psychic teleporting powers where she could talk to Picard from the other room and she got zips and zaps out of reality. I don't think Agent Wells could see her because he just kind of goes, what's going on? So I think she was mentally projecting herself to just Picard. I don't know. I didn't know she had this power. She probably hasn't done this before as far as I know, but I guess it, it helped get the story moving. And she basically says, oh, all humans are trapped in the past, which is something Q said, oh, I didn't trap Picard in the past. He came to the past. It's not about escaping. Or it's, it, it's yeah, it's not about time travel. It's about escaping. It's about how he escapes the trap. And this led Guinan to be like, oh, there's something else going on with Q here. All humans are trapped in the past. Humans have this great capacity to change themselves because they're always stuck in the past mentally, emotionally. You know, they always got something they need to get over and evolve from. And that's this great capacity that humans have. So, does that mean Q isn't actually dying? He's got to get over something. Did his son die? Did something happen that he's not really dying? He just needs to learn this human capacity of how to evolve and how to move on. Who is to say? Then we get the full backstory. Agent Wells was that little boy from the beginning that met the Vulcans in the woods. We don't know why they were there. He thought they were trying to rip his eyeballs out, but uh, no, it turns out that they were actually, he encountered them. They were trying to mind meld with him to remove the memory so he wasn't haunted by this horrible experience. At least that's what Picard says, that they were just trying to help you. And that's, that's this whole backstory, basically, that he encountered some aliens. He's been doing this lifelong quest of working for the FBI, trying to reveal that aliens were, were actually among us, that whole thing. So that's his whole backstory in a nutshell. And what happened is while they were uh, mind-melding with him, they were apparently transported back to their ship and weren't able to complete it. So he was left with this, as he views it, horrific memory of monsters in the woods trying to kill him that he was miraculously saved from. It is what it is. It wasn't the greatest. I mean, it was kind of just, you know, info dump. It, it wasn't really fleshed out very much. But we also have not seen Wells throughout the rest of the episode. So he's kind of introduced, given a backstory. Everything was wrapped up. Now he's good with it. Okay. Because he talked to Picard for two minutes. Back on the ship, suddenly the transporters are offline. So uh, that's obviously going to come into play later. Everyone's kind of stuck where they are, except for Picard's like, oh, I know, we will go and use Talon, not Laris's transporter. She wasn't in this episode, by the way. Just that one reference. Um, 
So anyways, now things are wrapped up, as I said, with Agent Wells, Guinan, and Picard. They're now all chummy. Guinan's like, well, maybe that crap happened to you just because uh, it was supposed to. Maybe you were supposed to have those terrible memories just so you could build up to this moment of letting us go so we could do our job. I, I don't believe that's the case. I mean, I think she was just trying to help him feel better. But he's basically, you know, well, I got fired because of my alien, you know, pep talk. I was trying to convince everyone there was aliens, even though there wasn't, so let's all go. Everyone get out of here. And that's, as far as we know, the end of his story. And we cut back. Gerardi is telling Soon, I, I need people. I, I need specimens. I, I need, you know, tech. How am I going to do this with this primitive, crappy technology you have? And then he's like, oh, I know what to do. And somehow this disgraced scientist, so we've seen he's a disgraced madman that the community thinks is, is dangerous. Then he goes to the gala, donates a bunch of money, and he's like this prestigious, respected guy. So we've got two sides. He's a dangerous madman everyone hates. He's also a prestigious scientist. We go back to the prestigious scientist here because suddenly he just calls some five-star general on the phone, or I don't know. I don't know why I said five-star. I don't think he specifies how high up he is. But he, he gets this whole special ops team. He gets all these ex-special forces soldiers to come help them. Um, then we got this kind of cool shot of nanoprobes on her fingertips. And then Gerardi goes, ooh. Well, poor Queen Gerardi's like, ooh, these, these, these will work fine. I'm going to add a lot of your biological distinctiveness to my own or some, some weird way of saying that when it's kind of creepy and sexual. And then she just starts to assimilate these special forces and turns them all into orgs. And that's where we leave it. The one thing that I didn't mention before, and because I kind of felt like they weren't going to do anything with it, and that's kind of what they did, is this fella here is, is Duquesne from the time ship relativity from Star Trek Voyager season, I'm not sure what season it is, I want to say season seven, but it's where Seven of Nine has to keep jumping through time to stop Captain Braxton from um, altering the past and destroying Voyager before it even left the Alpha Quadrant. Same actor that played Agent Wells. Now, H.G. Wells, of course, big time travel guy, the, the author. Um, this character, Duquesne, worked on the time ship Relativity, which was a Wells-class time ship. They keep referencing that all humans are stuck back in time. I might do a whole video on this, but it is conceivable he is playing the same character, somehow altered because of the alternate timeline, undercover in disguise uh an ancestor as we know that um, all the soons look exactly the same because they're all played by the same actor so maybe it's supposed to be a distant ancestor i was gonna say but yeah he's from the 29th century or another possibility is the time ship the time cops whatever you want to call them they recruit from time so they might recruit somebody from back in time the only problem with that would be Obviously, he's much younger here than he is in the episode we see him. So unless they also de-age them, I don't know what's going on. Maybe after they're done with their service, they return them to their own time, wipe their memories. There's a whole bunch of different situations that could be. Just bringing it up because it is the same actor. They went out of their way to give him a name that is very, very reminiscent of something he's already played. So that can't be a coincidence. Unless it was just a cheap nod to let us know, oh, we do realize that he, he was in Star Trek before, so we'll give him a wink and a nod, but he's not playing the same character. I don't know. I feel like there's more going on. I'm going to do a little more thinking on that and come back to you with probably a video just on him. Thoughts on this episode? A big step up from the last couple, but it still wasn't that great. Um, major problems with pacing again. Everyone split up just for the sake of being split up. The couple of things we do learn really aren't the things we wanted to learn. And we're two episodes away from the end of the series. And we haven't learned the big mysteries that are, that are really driving everything. It's a huge, huge mistake when you build a 10-episode arc, for lack of a better term. It may not be an arc. It may not even end because it may go into Season 3 for all we know. But it's a big, big mistake when you just build 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 for nine episodes with no payoff to have the payoff only in the last episode you need to start revealing things as you go at least that's my opinion 
Otherwise, when you get to episode 10, if it isn't the perfect explanation that's amazing and wraps everything up, everyone's going to be disappointed. Half the people have already dropped off in the middle of the series. And you got to start all over next year, and people aren't aren't necessarily going to be in the right mindset because they know you failed that before. Like, look at Discovery. They build, build, build these huge arcs, and the payoffs are never great. So I'm hoping that's not the case. I'm hoping whatever happens at the end of the season is great, and we learn something new that isn't terrible, but I'm losing my faith in that right now because we're so close to the end and we haven't gotten there. But until next time, do all those YouTube things, like, share, subscribe, whatever you want to do, dislike if you want. Until next time, computer and program.